So as, as you said, I, I'm a PhD student at the Center for Coastal and Ocean Mapping at the University of New Hampshire. It's a joint center with uh, NOAA. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about my dissertation research about mapping and measuring eelgrass beds with an MB1 sonar. So my background, I come from a biology and geology background. Um, so the motivation for this project for me is um, a lot of the ecosystem services provided by eelgrass beds. Um, as a marine plant, it's a primary producer. It's providing oxygen to the uh, marine ecosystem. It sequesters nutrients. It's going to take up nut um, nitrogen and phosphorus from the ecosystem. The roots and rhizomes of these plants trap and bind sediment in place and provides actually a degree of erosion control. Um, and because these plants are um, sticking up into the water column, they actually attenuate uh, waves and currents. So it encourages the settlement of particles and suspended sediments. And because they're protruding into the water column, they provide um, structure that a lot of fish species like, including a lot of commercially fish species, like um, this little bay scallop here. A lot of the young species of um, the young of species like cod and winter flounder really like this habitat. And there's a lot of biodiversity in these areas as well, relative to other parts of the seafloor. And of course, these plants are important from a regulatory standpoint as well. Um, because of these important ecosystem services, they are actually a protected wetland under the Clean Water Act. So um, dredging and construction projects, as far as I understand, you have to mitigate for the loss of this habitat if you are affecting it. Um, and those mitigation guidelines are often based on the amount of grass that you are affecting. So you need some really good maps of uh, where the grass is and how much there is. It's also a bioindicator for water quality um, because they're very sensitive to changes in uh, water clarity from increased phytoplankton blooms or suspended sediments. Um, they will suffer if you're having problems with water quality in the system as well. Um, and that's the motivation for a lot of seagrass mapping projects in the states right now, including in New Hampshire, where I'm working. Um, a switch from a seagrass-dominated ecosystem to an algae-dominated ecosystem is also um, an indicator of water quality issues um, or other anthropogenic impacts, like overfishing or eutrophication. Um, so you need to keep an eye on um, if your ecosystem is changing from seagrass to macroalgae as well. And of course, uh, coming from CECOM, JHC, I would be remiss if I didn't use um, this in my presentation, map once, use many times. So um, we're, as Harold mentioned, we're going over all these sites with these fancy multi-beam systems. Um, we can collect water column data. And ecologists and resource managers might be interested in looking at that data for things like seagrass mapping. So seagrass mapping, how are we doing this now? Um, there's really three main techniques. There's physical surveys, so divers or people walking off the beach um, and laying eyes on the bed. Um, this is the most verified method. You can go out and see what species there are. Um, but you can imagine over large spatial, spatial scales, this gets very time consuming or expensive, or you do a lot of interpolation. Uh, off water remote sensing, like aerial imagery, LIDAR, satellite imagery, um, can be a really powerful tool for mapping seagrass, um, but it can be hindered by conditions uh, like atmospheric conditions, clouds, haze. Um, or suspended sediments, to increased turbidity in the estuary. Um, and so in those areas, oh, and if it's, if it's deep too, the deep edges of the beds are really hard to see. Um, this is an image from Portsmouth Harbor, one of my study sites. And you can see in the shallow areas, it's pretty easy to distinguish these dark areas as areas of vegetation uh, from these lighter areas that's sand. Um, but you can see as you go further out offshore, where is that boundary? You can't really tell because of how light attenuates in the water column. Um, so in those situations, you want to use maybe on-water remote sensing like acoustics um, and towed video systems. So that depth limit, that maximum depth limit that you have difficulty seeing in aerial imagery is actually a really important measurement. Um, the deep edges of seagrass beds are actually the, sort of the front line of change for a lot of these issues with water, uh, water clarity or uh, sea level rise. So you can see the deeper um, vegetation is going to die off first if you have um, increased suspended sediments or phytoplankton because of that pre-existing light limitation there. So acoustics and seagrass. Um, probably a lot of people are familiar with the problem of having seagrass in your acoustics if you're trying to measure the bottom. Um, and that's the reason why these plants are so reflective is because they actually have air trapped in their leaves in these microscopic um, spaces called lacunae. And the air in there has a higher acoustic impedance, so it's going to reflect sound really well. Um, and this can actually, when there's a dense amount of grass, it's actually a problem with bottom detections. It can actually acoustically obscure the bottom or any objects you're trying to find in a seagrass bed. 
Um, these are two sonar traces from actually the nadir beam of the MB1. And you can see when it's bare seafloor, you have a really distinct, narrow, high amplitude peak. In this really dense uh, seagrass here from Portsmouth Harbor, the maximum return actually is somewhere in that eelgrass canopy, and the seafloor is the smaller return at the bottom. So if you're using a bottom detection algorithm that's um, just looking for that peak amplitude, uh, you're going to pick up the canopy and not the seafloor itself. So what I'm doing, um, I'm using the MB1 sonar to map seagrass beds um, because they're so reflective. This is um, a really great system for such shallow work. Seagrass grows in relatively shallow depths where I'm working five to 10 meters is sort of the max. Um, it's a nice small system. We can mount it on vessels of opportunity very easily. Um, and we can get this full water column return as well as even raw transducer element data, uh, which is really great for doing ex um, experiments with this sort of detection. So the goals of the multi-beam mapping I'm doing, the first is to develop a, um, a robust data processing and collection methodology that can be used for detecting these important um, parameters of seagrass beds, like that maximum depth limit, the canopy height, uh, the percent cover of the grass in these areas, and a way to distinguish macroalgae from eelgrass, which is also something that's challenging to do with aerial methods. And we want to demonstrate that this method is repeatable and applicable in a range of different seagrass environments. Um, so that involves testing the th thresholds of detection in terms of seagrass density, in terms of seagrass canopy height. Um, and we also want to overlap our data with these pre-existing eelgrass mapping data sets to show where um, we might be picking up grass that you can't see in aerial imagery and as a source of ground truthing for our data. So in 2014, uh, we took the MB1 and mounted it on substructures boat, the Orion. We used their RTK GPS system and uh, their POSMB. And we visited a couple of different locations throughout uh, the Great Bay Estuary in New Hampshire. We also tested two different transducer mounts. We were thinking in this really shallow water, it might be advantageous to tilt the transducer a little bit to the port side. Um, it turned out that the processing involved in that, the complications it added to processing, didn't really buy us, um, didn't really justify um, the coverage that we were getting. So here's just a couple of example pings from the first mapping efforts. This is a bare ping, the seafloor is a pretty recognizable feature. You also have that side lobe interference, which I'll talk about a little later. Here's a ping with some patchy eelgrass. Again, you can see the, the seafloor pretty distinctly there, and then you see these higher amplitude returns above the seafloor, and that's some patches of eelgrass. And now here's a ping with a lot of grass, and you can see it's really complicated. It's hard to tell where the canopy um, ends, where the seafloor begins. Um, so we decided to start our processing right at Nader because this is probably the one spot where you can actually see a distinct return from the seafloor through the canopy. So these are maps made from our 2014 data. The dark green is eelgrass that was delineated from orthorectified imagery. Um, the year previous, and then these track lines are actually canopy detections from the nadir beam of the MB1. And you can see in this area, it actually lines up pretty well with the orthorectified imagery, with maybe the exception of some erosion of the channels, actually. This is a transect of just um, the nadir beam from the MB1. And the reason why our detections are lining up pretty well with the orthorectified imagery is that the eelgrass here is very limited by the bathymetry. It grows right to the edges of the channels. Um, so it's not coming over the edge, and it was good for us to verify that that's true, that that is actually the maximum depth limit. But in this case, um, the aerial imagery is actually doing a pretty good job. This is another site in the Great Bay Estuary. This is a more open coastal site. Uh, the eelgrass grows a lot deeper in this area. It grows out to 10 meters. Um, it's also a really complex site. There's these really dense, really long um, eelgrass beds. The plants are up to two meters long. Um, but right next to some of those beds, there's actually these really uh, gravelly or bedrock places where there's lots of macroalgae. Um, and we see that reflected in our acoustic data as well. Um, again, this is a nadir beam transect. Um, the flat seafloor here with the tall vegetation growing above it is interpreted as seagrass in these rockier areas over here where you see sort of a rougher bottom and the short vegetation, that's macroalgae. And I'll talk a little bit about um, how we're going to plan to distinguish those. Here are the nadir canopy detections um, in Portsmouth Harbor. Again, it's lining up fairly well with that detected from the orthorectified imagery with a couple of exceptions. 
So in this bare area, um, according to the orthorectified imagery, we actually were able to detect these short, sparse patches that they couldn't see. And so that was kind of exciting. We were finding these new eelgrass beds that um, they had no idea were there. And we verified that with drop camera imagery as well. Out in the deeper depths, these are actually false canopy detections. And what's happening here is that we're essentially looking at the width of the bottom return to see if there's an eelgrass canopy there. And that's going to change uh, naturally with depth. That width is going to get longer as it takes longer, um, as the rise time increases for that um, bottom return. So we have to normalize our bottom returns for depth or uh, impose some sort of artificial um, limit where we would ex uh, a maximum depth limit where we wouldn't expect to see vegetation at all. This is the third site, New Hampshire Little Harbor. This was a, a site that actually the local monitoring agency asked us to check out because it is a really turbid site. Um, and they have difficulty seeing what's going on. It's a mooring field. There's, the boats kick up a lot of sediment. There's a lot of bubbles. Um, and again, it matches up pretty well, which we were kind of surprised about. Um, but it also offered a really good opportunity for us is that there was so much other stuff in the water column. In this case, there's a lot of fish schools. Um, do our detection algorithms work when eelgrass is not the only um, feature present in the water column? So in 2015, we took the MB1 out again and revisited those three sites so we can get an idea of the changes that we can detect. We also did two transects that were really targeted at areas that were mixes of macroalgae, nuisance macroalgae in particular, and eelgrass to see if we could tell the difference. And we went to an um, additional site where we wanted to see the difference between invasive and native macroalgae species. species. Um, it's a well understood site. And we went to an eelgrass monitoring site in Cape Cod Bay. So here's the MB1 mounting. Um, setup that we had this summer on a UNH vessel. This was a kind of vessel of opportunity mounting. Uh, it was just a simple pole mount attached to the side here. Um, we had the MB1 with the internal uh, motion sensor, so that was really good that it could account for any motions in the pole itself. Um, the only issue we had was that we had to be really careful that we didn't snag any lobster pots, which is a real problem for us. This is kind of hanging out over the side. These are the transects in Great Bay. Um, so the the idea here was to see if we could tell the difference between, between these nuisance macroalgae species that are increasing in the bay with increased nutrients. Um, in the northern transect, there's these distinct patches of the two where the macroalgae is actually just taking over um, areas of the eelgrass bed. And then in the southern transect, it's this really mixed bed. Um, to see, and we wanted to see if we could see that mix somehow um, in the acoustics. This is the invasive and native, native macroalgae site. This is Nubble Light in York, Maine. It's a really um, popular site with divers, both um, scientific divers and recreational divers. And Jen Dykstra at the center um, has done a lot of photo transects in this area. And they look really different um, just when you're down there. Um, they have very different morphologies. The kelps are obviously longer, maybe not as long as the kelps we have here on the west coast that I've seen. Um, but they're definitely different from this short, fibrous red algae. And so we're trying to pull out if we can tell the difference between those two acoustically. Then we took the MB1 down to the Province Sound Center for Coastal Studies in Massachusetts. We mounted it on their survey vessel, the RV Marindan. Um, they have a nice bow mounting system. This is um, bow mount when it's up. They lower it down at the survey sites. Um, and the idea here was to visit this site that the Park Service goes out and monitors every year. They do these really detailed transects that they return to. Um, they do density measurements, canopy height measurements, biomass. So it's a really good uh, validation data set for us. And it's also a very different environment from that which we see in New Hampshire. It's really short grass, so we're pushing our detection limits. Um, and it's a very dynamic system where you have sand waves migrating through the, the area. So this is just one transect from that area. And you can see, um, compared to the transects I had shown you before, um, it's really hard to tell that there's even vegetation there. And so we're going to see if if the algorithms that I'm developing are going to even be able to detect uh, those short little plants. So the data processing, sort of the low-hanging fruit in this project, is to get that maximum depth limit as long as we have a presence and absence measurement <coughs> from the uh, water column data and we have the underlying bathymetry, we can get this maximum depth limit pretty easily across um, large spatial areas. And then we can process for canopy height at Nader, and I'll, I'll show how we go through that. And we can do a percent cover of vegetation by looking at plus or minus 20 degrees of Nader. So this is, um, again, some traces from the Nader beam of the MB1. And these are sort of the three situations that we encounter when we're looking for the canopy. 
Um, on the left side here, this is sort of um, the worst case scenario, maybe from bottom detection, is that that maximum return is in the canopy. Um, and it's met when it's a bare seafloor, you just have one maximum amplitude. And um, the ideal situation on the right here is when you can have a distinct return from the canopy, but it's not the maximum. So how are we dealing with these three situations and pulling out both um, a bottom detection and a canopy detection? Uh, we stack successive pings. And then we filter those stacked traces with a low-pass filter. Um, and then looking at those stacked and filtered pings, we do an um, iterative background noise estimate so that we can pull out just that bottom return, look at the bottom return, and look at just the leading edge. Oh, go back and show. Look at just this leading edge where the amplitude first jumps up. Call that the top of the canopy. And then the last maximum in that bottom return we call um, the seafloor. And that helps us to get around this situation um, where there is a distinct peak for the seafloor, but it's not the maximum return. I'm not sure how to. So, how do I get the video to work? I can't see it on the screen. Is that, is that a video? Yeah, it is a video. Okay, let's see if we can try this up. Is that running? No. It was running for a second. <laughs> Let's see. It's running now. <laughs> okay. Let's Let's see. Oh. Well, so this, this yeah, is a video yeah, going yeah, through. Yeah, it's <laughs> okay. it's We're going through a single line of data here um, and using those same sort of canopy detection methods that we were using at Nader. So far, we've pushed it out to plus or minus 20 degrees of Nader. Um, and in the beams where we can detect a canopy over a certain height, we say, okay, that beam has eelgrass in it, um, and the percentage of beams within that swath that have eelgrass, um, that goes to our percent cover measurement. Um, and so you can see as we're going through here, it, we have some really tall grass, some short grass, some areas where the canopy detection is right at the seafloor, which means there's probably no grass. So future work, of course, we're trying to push that canopy and seafloor detection out across the entire swath. Um, probably once we get further out, um, to these outer beams, we're dealing with that side lobe interference. So I'm working right now on um, doing sort of a, another, um, sort of going back and looking through the noise that we discarded before and try to pull out the side lobes from there and filter it out. Um, and that, that should help reduce some of that side lobe noise. And it probably will um, lead to image processing methods as we go further out. We might not be able to look down each beam and see where the canopy and the seafloor are, but we can look at the shape of the return out here as a whole. You can see that the bottom return is a lot wider. That's probably where there's grass. And on the left side here, you have this narrower return. That's probably bare. So really a shape-based sort of estimate of presence and absence. And then discriminating eelgrass or macroalgae. There's sort of two different situations. Um, in this open coastal site where you have the eelgrass, um, excuse me, the macroalgae really limited to the rocky areas. Um, the two parameters we'll be looking at are the bottom roughness and the canopy height. And looking at those, we can probably discriminate which is, which is eelgrass and which is macroalgae. But then when we get further up the estuary where you have this invasive um, or nuisance macroalgae, it's just a lot shorter um, than a lot of the seagrass. So on the right side of this transect, um, you have this short vegetation. And actually, that's an area where we have this mat of invasive grassalaria macroalgae. And it looks very different than this taller seagrass that we could map. Um, so in that case, we'll do it by the canopy head itself. And then the layover of the plants under current, this is sort of a, an added bonus. Um, when divers are going out and measuring canopy height, they're looking at the actual length of the leaves themselves. When, but when we're measuring canopy height, we're looking at the plants as they're being acted upon by currents. And they actually um, are bending to accommodate the drag um, of the currents passing over them. And they can bend to over half their, their natural length. And there's actually existing hydrodynamic models that talk about the, uh, that quantify that reconfiguration of the plants under currents. And those have only been tested in flumes, so we're hoping to test those in the field and then use that to correct our data um, for the full length of these plants. All right, and that's it. I'll take any questions. Yeah, the bottom peak. Let's say the slope of the, the, the edge. 
bottom For the bottom return itself? Yeah, so if you look at that, um, that time series, you see, so there's a, there's a big return for the field grass and then even bigger one for the C4. Mm -hmm. would, you, would you be able to say, look at maybe the slope of that leading edge or other crowds? Would that give any information? Oh, I haven't looked at the slope of the leading edge yet, but that, that might be a, a good way um, of looking at it. Sort of, sort of what we're doing here is trying to pull out that bottom return itself first from the noise, and then wherever that break is. Um, I don't know if that's going to tell you the difference between eelgrass and the bottom necessarily, um, but it, it might. It's worth looking into. So, the bottom classification in terms of like a Roxanne kind of. Yeah, Roxanne classification is not available anymore. Yeah. Like in the backscatter data, yeah. So you can actually do that pretty well with side scan data, but what you're not getting from that is the actual structure of the seafloor of the canopy itself. Rather, you're not going to get the height of the plants. Um, but that's certainly a, another way to go in terms of detecting the grass. Doug. <laughs> uh, did, did you guys uh, drop all the way back to the raw data for these? We haven't yet. So, so you're using the TDY? Yeah, we're using the TDY files. The raw data, um, that's going to be sort of a side project, is just figuring out if you know, we increase the number of beans, what does that get us? If we go to really you know, fat beans, how, how does that change the signal? That's sort of a another um, best practice question that we want to answer. <laughs>